And Peter goes, well, hang on a second. God does not count patience in the same way that you do. If you say God is time, that doesn't lead you to pantheism because I haven't made the statement God and the universe are identical. Because are you identical to time? Like, no. Am I identical to time? No. Is the universe identical to time? No. So God is time and the universe exists in time. No pantheism. Uh, so I did a dialogue with William Lane Craig recently. And yeah, he brought up this issue of, well, we don't say time died on the cross. We don't say like, you know, time saved us. And I'm like, well, yeah, God is good. God is love. God is uh, omnipotent. We don't say omnipotence died on the cross. We don't say omnipotence saves us. We say the person that has these attributes saved us. Hey everyone, uh, welcome to Anti Podcast. My name is Nemanja Jurišić. Uh, this is YouTube channel of Science and Theology. So uh, today we have a very special guest, uh, Dr. Ryan Mullins. Dr. Mullins, welcome and how are you? Thank you so much for bringing me on the show. Okay, uh, Dr. Mullins have a PhD from uh, University of St. Andrews in uh, philosophical theology. And he published uh, over 50 essays on various topics in uh, philosophical theology about models of God, philosophy of time, problem of evil and similar. And also one more thing, uh, he uh, is uh, writing a book, I believe, with uh, our scholar uh, John Peckham. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is great and interesting. So thank you for being with us here. We can start with questions uh, before we talk about uh, philosophy and theology. Can you describe what is time? Yeah, so there's a big debate over this question that is been pretty much ignored over the last 100 years or so. Uh, and so I take what's called an absolute theory of time, which says that time is a natured entity. It's an actual thing. And it's this natured entity that makes change possible. So it's the explanation for why change is possible. It's the source of moments of time. I'll explain what those are in a second. So time is though it's this natured entity that makes change possible. It's the source of moments. And then it's the thing that orders all of these different moments into a successive timeline. Uh, and so most of what we do in physics is we're interested in just the timeline. We're not interested in, in time itself. And same thing within philosophy. Most of the time, people are not interested in time itself. They're only interested in just the timeline. So let me explain what those moments of time are. So a moment of time is the way things are, but could be subsequently otherwise. So if you were to pause the entire universe right now, there'd be a way things are. There's like a full description of the way things are, but things could be different at the next subsequent moment. And so that's all a moment is just like a snapshot of reality. It's just, here's the way things are. They could be different next at the next moment, but this is how they are at this moment. So time is the thing that's the source of those moments. And it's the thing that organizes those moments into a coherent timeline. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the next question, is God temporal or timeless? So I want to say God's temporal, but let me, let me define some of these terms so people have a clue what we're talking about. So to say that God is eternal, like everyone agrees on that. No one's denying that God is eternal. To say God's eternal just means to exist without beginning and without end. When you're looking at the history of Western philosophical theology, not just Judaism, uh, Christianity, and Islam, but like, you know, the whole gamut of Western philosophical theology, uh, religious and non, everyone thinks that eternity has at least two meanings. It can be a temporal eternity or a timeless eternity. So if something's eternal, it exists without beginning and without end. If you want to say that God is timeless, you need to add some claims above and beyond that. So what you say is God is timeless if and only if God exists without beginning and without end, but also without succession. So God doesn't do one thing and then another and then another. God just exists all at once in some sort of timeless present without a before and after. So he exists without succession and he exists without temporal location. So God does not exist right now. God does not exist in the past. God does not exist in the future. God does not exist right now. You just have to say God exists. Full stop. And that's it. Which seems kind of weird because a lot of a lot of theists are going to want to say, well, of course, God exists right now. But if you think God is timeless, you have to go, no, that's not true. God does not exist right now. And that sounds silly, uh, which is one of many reasons why I want to reject the view, because if a view forces me to say silly things, I don't I don't typically like it um, to say that God's temporal. So you say God exists without beginning and without end because God's eternal. 
but God can undergo succession. God can do one thing and then another and then another. And God can have temporal location. So God exists right now. God did exist in the past. God will exist in the future. And God exists right now. Uh, so I want to affirm that view, that God's temporal. If you want to know why, we can talk about that. But, it, but, it, 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 but at least like at the moment, I'm just saying like that's the view I want to affirm. Okay. Uh, can we talk uh, about why he's temporal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of different reasons. Um, here's one. So a very common attribute is omnipresence. Like everyone wants to say God is omnipresent. Well, what does it mean to be omnipresent? God is like is 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 a uh, holy present at some particular moment in some particular place in terms of he knows everything that's going on there and he is causally sustaining that 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 moment and that place in existence. Then there's a whole line in um within the western traditions that says not, not just simply those two things but also like God's like whole being is wholly located at that particular place and time. Okay, well, think about that. God's wholly located right now. Well, if God's timeless, he can't be wholly located right now uh, because then he would have a temporal location and he would be temporal. If you exist at a moment, you are temporal. So if God really is omnipresent in the full sense that traditional theists want to say, well, then they cannot affirm divine timelessness. They're going to have to say, you know, some, they're going to have to say God's temporal because he, he's wholly located right here, right now. So that's 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 a pretty big conflict. There's a lot of other arguments, but that's like that's one that's it's quite serious. And the way people try to get out of it is wild. What they end up doing is saying God's not really related to the universe. He does not stand in a real relation to the universe. And in which case, then you just really I really want to say, I'm sorry, but you told me God was omnipresent. And now you're telling me he's not really related to this this moment. What what are you talking about? This sounds crazy. And again, like I said earlier, like I don't want to hold views that force me to say really crazy things. Like I'm going to say some crazy stuff every now and then. But like if I consistently have to say crazy stuff, then you know I don't know what I'm doing here. Yeah, thank you. This is great. Um, so uh, can you explain just uh, why um, classical theism is wrong? Uh, because I believe most scholars uh, agree that this is true. So how you respond to that? Yeah, so this is actually highly controversial. So classical theism um, is the view of, of God. Let me back up a little bit. So there's the the concept of God, the idea of God, and then these different models of God. So the concept of God is that of a perfect being, which is the single ultimate foundation of reality. And so all the different theories, all the different models of God agree on this basic concept. So everyone's going to be like, yeah, yeah, whatever God is, is perfect, whatever God is, foundation of reality. But that whatever is, is is the is the key question. So the way people unpack what it means for God to be perfect and what it means for God to be the ultimate foundation of reality, this is where you develop your unique model of God. And so classical theism wants to say God is perfect, of course, but there's certain attributes that God has to have, such as being timeless, uh, immutable, meaning can't change in any way, shape, or form. No changes whatsoever. Uh, simple. It's divine simplicity is the divine attribute, which says God has no attributes. That's that's a whole cra crazy thing. And then impassibility, which says that God cannot be moved or influenced by anything outside of himself for his beliefs, for his emotions and for his actions. And then the way that God's the foundation of reality is by creating the universe out of nothing. So that's the classical model. Uh, the standard story is everybody throughout history affirmed this view. Um, what I've been doing in a lot of my contemporary, a lot of my current research right now is just uncovering the actual history of ideas and discovering, <laughs> no, that's a lie. That's an absolute lie. Uh, this has not been the majority view. Um, so the, for example, in the Islamic tradition, the majority view is to go define simplicity as false, just outright false. Um, and in Jewish tradition, some of these attributes were not terribly popular. So there's a bit of a mythology going on here. So here's a problem for classical theism. So creation out of nothing says that there's a state of affairs where God exists without the universe, where God exists all alone. You see this explicitly stated in a lot of different uh, classical theists like John of Damascus, Boethius, uh, Peter Lombard, uh, Thomas Aquinas, and so on. You see this really explicitly in Al-Ghazali in the Islamic tradition. You see this really explicitly in Moses Maimonides in the Jewish tradition, this claim that God exists all alone prior to creation. It becomes textbook by you get to the time they get to Middle Ages. So God all alone without anything. 
and then God with a universe. This is the doctrine of creation out of nothing. You want to say that God is timeless and changeless. He doesn't change in any way, shape, or form. He doesn't undergo any succession. And yet somehow you've got God all alone and then God with all this stuff. That's a change. Like mm -hmm. you can't have God all alone and then God with stuff. Like that's clearly a change. That's succession. So you're going to lose immutability. You're going to lose timelessness. And so this is a serious problem for classical theism. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, many Christians say that uh, if God created matter and space, then he should be immaterial and spaceless. And also, if God created time, then he should be timeless. That's uh, That sounds uh, logical, but is this correct? I want to say no. There's a lot of different reasons why. It depends what you think time is. So one of the things that's super frustrating when you're looking at the history of Christian thought is you see people ask the question, what is time? And St. Augustine has this funny quote where he says, I know exactly what time is, unless you ask me, then I don't know anymore. <laughs> and, and it's funny. It's good. Because like Augustine's got a lot of jokes at various points. But throughout the, throughout the Christian tradition, you'll see people keep repeating that line. And, and then they'll also say, God creates time. And I'm like, you don't know what time is, but you know it's created? Uh, that seems like it lacks justification. So that's one problem. Another problem is if you actually start to define what time is, there's two different views. So the one I laid out earlier, and then another one which says time's not really a thing. This is what's called the relational theory. Time's not really a thing, um, or time just kind of exists if and only if change exists. So if anything changes, then there's time because there's a before and after. So God all alone then creates a universe, and now he exists with stuff. Well, God's created time because he's brought about change. Well, God could still change then. He'd be temporal, um, but you know he's undergoing change. So, but you've got an explanation for it, that's the case. Here's what I, want to, what, I, what I want to do though. This is one of the few things I'll say that's crazy. Uh, so I want to say uh, time is not created because time is an attribute of God. You see this in people like Isaac Newton. He, he affirmed this view. Uh, and then in the Hindu tradition, there's a lot of people who affirm this view. Uh, one of which is this guy named uh, uh, Raghunatha Sharomani. Uh, so he exists kind of around the same time period as Isaac Newton, but they never talked. There's no evidence that they talked, but they both had the same view. So time is an attribute of God. It's an essential attribute of God because God is that thing that makes change possible. He's the source of the moments, and he's the thing that organizes a series of moments into a timeline. So my view is God does not create time. God is temporal. He is time itself in the same way that he is goodness or he is he is powerful and all this. So you've got a nice explanation for where the series of moments comes from, because God is time and time is the thing that is the source of the moments. Uh, thank you. Uh, is that connected with pantheism? Because uh, Craig said uh, time cannot save us and uh, God can. So <laughs> how do you explain that? Yeah. So pantheism is much stronger claim. So pantheism is the, is the view that God and the universe are identical. Uh, sometimes there's a little bit more nuance, like dealing with what's called a constitution relation. That's super technical. We don't need to worry about it. God and the universe are identical. If you say God is time, that doesn't lead you to pantheism because I haven't made the statement God and the universe are identical. Because are you identical to time? Like, no. Am I identical to time? No. Is the universe identical to time? No. So God is time and the universe exists in time. No pantheism. So that's not a problem. Now, now Craig was worried about, uh, so I did a dialogue with William Lane Craig recently, and yeah, he brought up this issue of, well, we don't say time died on the cross. We don't say like, you know, time saved us. I'm like, well, yeah, God is good. God is love. God is uh, omnipotent. We don't say omnipotence died on the cross. We don't say omnipotence saves us. We say the person that has these attributes saved us. Time is an attribute. Well, yeah, so time doesn't die on the cross. God, the son, dies on the cross, and he has a bunch of attributes like love, power, goodness, temporality, eternality. I mean, so necessary existence didn't die on the, you know, but these are things I want to predicate of God. So I, do, I just don't see what the objection is when you just parse out like what, what we're actually talking about. So it has like a little bit of a rhetorical bite at first, but I think when you unpack it, then there's no problem here. Yeah, I agree. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you just a little uh, address um, his view? Uh, I mean, uh, Craig, because uh, mm -hmm. he says that, um, God was timeless, and when uh, he created the universe, uh, then he became uh, temporal, if I believe he said it. It's close. So he doesn't want to say, and then. 
And here's why, because if you've got God timeless and then God becomes temporal, you've got this before and after relationship. And if there's a before, well, then that means time was there. So God can't be timeless before, you know, so, and Craig knows this very well. He knows that's incoherent. So what he says is God is timeless without the universe and temporal with the universe. So you don't have a before and after relationship. So you don't have a a temporal relationship between these two phases of God's life. Here's where things get really mysterious. Everyone wants to know what exactly is that relationship between God's timeless phase and God's temporal phase, because it's not a before and after. It can't be a simultaneous with, because that's a temporal relation. And also you'd have God being timeless and temporal simultaneously. Like you'd have a contradiction and Craig's like, no, of course not. Cause Craig's not an idiot. He's not going to say that, you know, he says, things like it's logically prior. That's not good enough because logical priority is you capture logical priority when two things can be co-realized. Um, so if I'm looking at the premises of an argument, a logically valid argument, if P then Q, P therefore Q, all those premises can be co-realized because we're just looking at symbols. Two plus two equals four. The two plus two and the four, those can all be co-realized because again, we're just looking at mathematical objects contradictory states of affairs like timeless and temporal without the universe with the universe those cannot be co-realized because then you'd have a contradiction so logical priority doesn't capture whatever is going on here another uh, claim craig makes sometimes is it's causal priority the timeless phase is causally prior to the temporal phase that just raises more mystery because causal relationships, typically most people want to say causal relationships are temporally prior to their effects. The cause is temporally prior to the effect. And Craig's not saying that because it's supposed to be this timeless thing. So we're like, okay. And another view you could hold is causes can be simultaneous with their effects. Well, Craig's not going to have that because then you'd have timeless and temporality simultaneous with each other. That's incoherent. We already talked about that. So I don't know. I just don't know what like what this view is anymore. And it like, seems like we've run out of options. Uh, and there's like a few more steps you could try to do. But again, it's it's basically the sort of argument I'm, I'm trying to lay out is I don't know what this means. And I've exhausted all of the possible options of what it could mean. So it might be that the statement is just meaningless. <laughs> and that's not, I mean, that's not good. You don't want that. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. we, um Go next to the questions. Uh, does it matter if God is timeless? How does it affect on our salvation, theology, and relationship with Christ and uh, practice? So the practice, I think, is a really good question to bring up. Um, because I used to say, what I used to say is it doesn't matter at all. Because everyone has incoherent beliefs. So if you believe God's timeless, then, well, you know, you've probably got, I've got incoherent beliefs too. So, okay, whatever. Like, it doesn't affect anything. Because we're all idiots. <laughs> but uh, but there are some consequences, though. So if you think God's timeless, then God cannot respond because to respond is to like something happens and then you respond to whatever that event is. Well, God can't have any and then in his life if he's timeless. So you pray, God, please help me with my my exams coming up. Uh, I've got this very scary doctor's appointment. Please help me. Uh, God, I'm so thankful for the salvation you've given me. You know, any sort of prayer you want, doesn't matter. God cannot respond to it. Now that sounds really shocking, but you'll see a lot of people who are very upfront about this. So Paul Helm, who is a brilliant thinker, he is a contemporary philosopher who defends divine timelessness. He has a whole bunch of papers on this where he's trying to explain like, yeah, you know, God just appears to respond, but he doesn't really respond. And so he's very, very upfront about this because he knows these are the logical entailments of God being timeless. I find that really difficult to, to swallow because like that's a I mean, that's that's a really radical claim. God just cannot respond to anything. Whereas when you look at the Bible, it seems like, you know, God saying, hey, if you repent, I will forgive. Well, that's a response. Mm -hmm. uh, if you pray, I might respond. I might not to. I don't have to. Uh, maybe your prayer is stupid. And I'm just like, no, no. Um, or maybe I will respond. You know, God's got options. He can respond. But if he's timeless, no, not at all. And that's, I, I think that would be a really serious consequence for your for your practice. 
Yeah, in Joel, he says, uh, who knows, maybe he answers, <laughs> maybe mm -hmm. not. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, how do you explain Second Peter uh, 3, 8, uh, that with Lord, one day is like a thousand years? How do you understand this passage? And also uh, Psalm 90, 94, I believe. <laughs> no, or 90 uh, verse 2? Yeah. Yeah, so let's start with the Psalm 91. Um, so Psalm 90 has this claim that like, uh, before the earth is established, before the, the world is established, there is God from everlasting to everlasting. This is the verse you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So this view, um, so the everlasting to everlasting, uh, the Hebrew word is Olam and it's used twice and it's using an Olam just means a long time. That's what the word literally means is a long time. All of the words for eternity in the Bible are temporal terms. Uh, they all are, every single one of them. There's no timelessness at all in the, in the Bible. <laughs> and when you look at olam to olam, you're like, why everlasting to everlasting? Here's why. The Old Testament has a particular, Old Testament authors, they have a particular way of talking about a stretch of time. So they'll often use this to from formula to talk about some sort of uh, length of time. So from the days of King David to the, the, the days of King Solomon, here's what's happening. So it's a to from. And when you have from everlasting to everlasting, it's trying to talk about God's existed for a really, really long time. Mm -hmm. When does God exist for a really, really long time? Before the heavens and the earth are created. So remember earlier when I was talking about creation out of nothing, you've got some sort of state of affairs where God exists all alone. And then God exists with all this cosmic stuff. What's going on? Well, prior to creation, God exists all alone. How long? Well, from everlasting to everlasting. Like, I, like there's, it seems like the conditions for developing a clock are just not there. So how long? There's no fact of the matter of how long, but he's been existing temporally. That's the Psalm passage. Now let's look at Hebrews, uh, or not Hebrews, uh, Second Peter, sorry. Second Peter, the whole context is really interesting. Um, so people are being impatient and they're going, when is Christ going to return? You know, look, all this terrible stuff's happening. Uh, there's like wars, there's rumors of wars, there's like some natural disasters, you know, like, you know, everything is exactly the same as it has always been. Jesus is not coming back. What are you guys going on about? You guys are, are just nuts. And Peter goes, well, hang on a second. God does not count patience in the same way that you do. Because you and I, like, like, okay, I'm in, I live in Philadelphia in America. People here have no patience. When you're at a stoplight and the, the light turns green, if, you have, if you're not already through the stoplight before it turns green, the person behind you is honking their horn. They're angry. They're so angry. They have no patience at all. God's patience is not like that. For people in Philadelphia, 15 seconds is like an eternity. It's like, oh my gosh, you know. Whereas for God, a thousand years, that's nothing. That's nothing. It's a drop in the bucket. And so that's, that's this, this simile that Peter uses or this metaphor that Peter uses is, is, is really beautiful because it's like for a thousand days, a thousand years, that's just like one day for God. It's no big deal. So he does not count patience in the same way that you are because he's really, really patient. A thousand years, he can wait that out. You know, who cares? Whereas it's like, I'm like a thousand years. Oh my gosh, that's a long time. This is what's going on in this passage saying... God is much more patient than you are. Yeah, someone tried to um, make a mathematical equation. Uh, <laughs> 1,000 years is equal to one day in our Earth. So mm -hmm. you disagree, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, next question. Does God know the future? If yes, how you deal with apparent contradiction between human free will, freedom of choice, and uh, God's omniscience? This one is a complicated one. I don't really know the answer to it, um, but I can give you some of the options here. Okay. So one big question is, so say you want to answer yes, God does know the future. Well, now you have to answer another question. How does God know the future? How does he get that knowledge? Because you can't just go, well, God just gets it for free. Like you have to have an explanation for how God gets the knowledge. Here's one explanation. God knows the future because he knows that he himself has causally determined exactly how the future is going to go. So you see this in Calvinism, you see this in uh, Thomism, um, and a lot of different versions of theological determinism. 
So God knows exactly how the history is going to go because he's causally determining everything that happens. He knows what you're going to think because he knows I'm going to cause you to think this way. I, I, he knows you're going to act this way because he's, he's like, I know I'm going to cause you to act this way. But trust me, you have free will. Trust me. On that one, I can't. I, I can't. I'm sorry. I, I can't. I can't go. No, 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 no. There's no there's no way I have free will because God's causing all my thoughts. He's causing all my actions. He's causing me to have the reasons that I have that I, that I think motivate my actions. I, I don't see how I have free will. Another possible answer is there just are truths about what you would do in all these different situations. That's what's called Molinism. Uh, and so when God creates a universe, he, he, he then knows, okay, well, this is just what's going to happen because I've set up the circumstances. And so this is what these people will do. It's a little bit more difficult to figure out how you do not have free will in the situation. It's not impossible to argue against uh, you having free will here. It's just a bit more tricky is all because you don't have God causally determining everything. God's just saying, yeah, I know that if I put you in this circumstance, you're going to do this. The worry some people have is they'll go, that looks like entrapment. Like, like I didn't, I didn't choose this circumstance, uh, but God did. And so God knows I'm going to do this. Like he's not causing me to do it. You know, that's, that's, that's certainly the case, but it looks like he's kind of still kind of manipulating the situation in a weird sort of way. That's, that's, that's tricky. And then there's these questions about like, why are these truths just floating out there in the world about what you're going to do? Some people don't like that. They think that's just weird. If you want to deny that God knows the future, it might not be too big of a deal. Um, so here's what you'd be saying. God decides to create a universe where the future is completely open to some extent. There's like, maybe there's some things that are settled, like a, like a comet that comes around every once in a while around the planet earth you know it's just determined by the laws of nature so that's going to happen that's no big deal um but what what creatures like you and i are going to do with our own free will that's not fully decided it's it's, it's the story is uh, has not been written yet now the worry people have with this view is they're like okay you've got freedom you've got all this freedom well god doesn't have omniscience is, is, is a common claim god doesn't know everything and this view this open theist view says no 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 there are no truths about the future to know. So God does know all the facts. There's just no all, there are no facts about the future. So God knows everything. He really does. And God knows all the possibilities of what could happen in the future. And he knows the probabilities of what will happen in the future. And he uses that knowledge to providentially arrange things. So you don't really get a diminishment in God's power at all. You don't get a diminishment in God's knowledge. Um, and you get this robust kind of freedom. There's still some worries you can you might have though, because you might go, can God really providentially like make the world good? Like, can God really pull that off if he doesn't know exactly how it's gonna go? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, great. Uh can you um give some evidences uh, that we as humans uh, have free will? Oh, some evidence. Oh gosh. Um, so the standard evidence that people give is intuition. It really like when I go go out about my my regular day to day life, it really does seem like I am making choices and that people are not forcing my hand. Well, in Philadelphia, you know, someone might hold a gun to my head and, and, and rob me. That forces my hand. But but most of the time, you know, I'm just walking about doing my own thing. And I and I'm and it seems like I'm making choices. Mm -hmm. It seems like sometimes I have to deliberate, like I have to think about what do I actually want to do. And so. So a common source of evidence is just your day-to-day -day experience of making choices and acting for a reason. And, and, and just your experience of going, I know I could have done otherwise. I know I could have done this or that. And I had to sit and think like, do I actually want this? Other times you don't have to sit and think about it because you know you've, you, you just know what you want. You know, you, and you're like, that's what I want to do. But this, but this is your, your common experience is, is, a, is a main source of kind of pumping your intuitions in favor of having uh, free will. Uh, thank you. What about uh, subconscious? Uh, maybe that affect on our uh, free will, but we don't get it. So maybe we don't have free will. How do you respond on that? <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's definitely the case that you've got a whole range of uh, like different assumptions you make about the world. You've got a whole range of intuitions and these instincts. I think that's all fine as long as it doesn't uh, like fully determine the the exact way you do like all the time. Um, so in, in fact, I think like instincts are part of what help prime you to make 
uh, actions and then to develop what's called a mental schema. So as we develop, we create this sort of like mental map of the way we think the world is. And that mental schema really um, deeply in shapes our the actions the actions we choose to perform. So, I, uh, I I I've cultivated a, a particular mental schema where I think cheeseburgers are just the best thing in the world. So when it comes lunchtime, what am I going to eat? I don't need to think about it. I just know I'm going to get a cheeseburger. But that's something that I have developed over time. So if I have some sort of indirect control over shaping how I see the world and shaping my character. When the time comes, maybe some of my choices are not, there's no deliberation. It's just very automatic. It's automatic because of the experiences I've had and the way I've cultivated my character. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, but your character is not always fully in your control because, you know, you've got this whole thing called your environment that you're in. How all this plays out together, I don't fully know, but you can do things to try to shape your character. You can do things to try to change your character. And that in turn has knock on effects for the kinds of choices you'll make later on down the road. So where exactly your control is in, uh, in, in over your actions, it comes at a bunch of different places, sometimes like sort of shape, trying to shape your, your uh, subconsciousness or your character is one of the ways you can try to do these things. Thank you. If so someone try, because I don't know if you can successfully pull it off. Next question. If God is timeless, then what about Christ incarnation? Is that a problem for a classical theism? Yes, I think it's a serious problem. I've, I've published a bunch on this. So here's the claim that they'll try to make. So you've got one person with two natures. And the one person, Jesus Christ, he gets properties from both natures somehow. Uh, this is what's called the communication of the idioms or the communicatio idiomatum. If you want to throw around some unnecessary Latin. But the claim is the properties somehow fall on the person. So what you have is the statement that on the, like when Jesus is incarnate, he is temporal and he is timeless. Well, that's a contradiction. That's a contradiction. Well, what they try to do is they'll try to say, well, it's only the divine nature that has the uh, time, the property of timelessness. It's only the human nature that has the property of being temporal. Logically, like you're like, okay, cool. That's a fine point in terms of the semantics, but but want to know what like the metaphysics, like how does that actually work? Because we still have to say that one person has both of these properties, and that doesn't seem to make any sense, especially if you think that that one person on classical theism is simple. That one person is identical to the divine nature. So you're saying that a person that is identical to timelessness somehow also has the property of being temporal. That, that doesn't make any sense. Now you no longer can really talk in terms of these different parts. Um, also, if God's simple, God does not have properties. That's part of what it means to be simple, is to not have any properties. So this one simple person that cannot possibly have any properties somehow has properties from the human nature? You've got a being that cannot have properties and has properties. Contradiction. Also, if you're an impassable person, to be impassable just means you cannot be moved or influenced by anything outside of yourself for your beliefs, your emotions, your actions, which entails you cannot suffer. Mm -hmm. So a being that is identical to impassibility, a person that is identical to impassibility, so it's impossible to suffer, somehow that thing that's identical to, to the inability to suffer is suffering. What's doing the suffering? This is a good question to ask. And it's, the answer is really scary. What's doing the suffering is not actually the divine person at all. It's a human soul and a human body that's supposed to have this intimate relationship with this divine person. So this human soul and this human body are doing all the suffering while the divine person's just feeling nothing but pure happiness. Okay. This sounds like two people. Uh, and, <laughs> and in fact, um, there's a heresy called Nestorianism. And Nestorius, this was his view. He's like, yeah, you've got this one guy over here that's doing the suffering and this other divine person that's not suffering. Uh, and the Orthodox view says, ah, it's mysterious. So yes, this is all what's <laughs> going on, but it's mysterious. And Nestorius gets condemned. That's not good. Um, but then he looks at the, the results of like all these councils and he's like, yeah, that's what I've been saying all along. I agree with all of you. They're like, you should not be able to agree if you hold this wildly different view because he doesn't have a wildly different view. So the traditional view is, 
I think just is Nestorian. It really is. And and I'm not the only one who thinks that because when you look at the Council of Chalc Chalcedon in, in 450, uh, 451, um, so Nestorius gets condemned. And then afterwards he says, yeah, that's what I've been affirming all along. And then all, all these different parties that either like Nestorius, they say, yeah, this is good. We, we agree to this. And then a bunch of people who do not like Nestorianism, they get upset and say, that council is just Nestorian. What are you guys doing? So they have to have another council like 100 years later to try to figure out like what's going on because it's just a complete mess. It's not clear. And so the traditional view, I, I think, is, is, just, is, just a, is just a bit of a mess, and primarily because they're assuming this classical doctrine of God that just is not compatible. It's not consistent with an incarnation. Wow, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. This is great. Um, can I ask you, um, sorry for this, but uh, how mm -hmm. and uh, how this uh, doctrine of uh, timeless God enter in early church? Can you briefly uh, describe that? It's it's a bit. The whole history is a bit tricky, but basically, what you could say is something like this: the science of the day, um, science and philosophy. They're all mixed up together at that time. There's not a neat distinction between philosophy and science. So the science of the day um, that that's really popular among Neoplatonists, so someone like Plotinus, is you've got this classical thing, this thing called the one that's timeless, it's simple, it's impassable, it's completely beyond, it's even beyond the beyond. I don't know what that means, but these are statements you hear. That's the science of the day. And if you are some young intellectual you want to be consistent with the science of the day mm -hmm. well that's what you see a lot of people wanting to be consistent with the science of the day you see people like augustine wanting to be consistent with the science of the day you see a lot of uh early christians trying to be consistent with the science of the day and it has a has an influence on the doctrine of god and a whole bunch of knock-on effects within um, christian thought so i think that's the main motivation here is people are just trying to be consistent with what this supposedly the scientific worldview is at the time something like uh scientism if i'm correct uh, it would be a bit different um because what we now call scientism it, there's is a whole complicated history and so what we call scientism now would be something like some sort of like weird like really hard-lined empiricism and that wouldn't exactly be what what you'd have back then but just some some desire to be scientific i guess yeah that's, that's the probably the best way to put it Thank you. And uh, I get the impression that um, all this, so you talk uh, that uh, timeless God is less omniscient than, than uh, temporal God. Am I correct? Yeah, here's why. Uh, so if you think that God is timeless, then th th there's certain things God cannot know. So can God know what's happening right now? And, and the answer is, well, well, no, because what's happening right now is constantly changing. The sum total facts of reality are constantly changing because because the way the world is is constantly changing. And can God know that? You get different answers in the Christian tradition. So Augustine, he's kind of bothered by this question. He's like, can God know what's happening right now? Well, if he did, he'd be temporal. We don't want that. We got, God's got to be timeless. Okay, God just doesn't know what's happening right now. And who cares? Cool. It's not a big deal. And I'm like, well, I think it's a big deal. I think it's a big deal. Uh, and and Aquinas, Aquinas does think that's a big deal because he's like, if I know something that God does not know, is God, is God really omniscient? So he's really bothered by this. And so he tries to figure out a way to get God knowledge of the present, but it ends up not getting God any knowledge of the present at all. And this is actually a really common um, problem throughout the entire Western tradition of trying to figure out how to get God knowledge of certain things like the present and like just the particulars of reality uh, without making everything absolutely necessary uh, and without bringing all of reality into like some sort of timeless existence. So it's it's a serious problem. And, and I think the easiest solution is just go, look, you can't you can't get a timeless God having knowledge of temporal reality. So just get rid of timelessness. Like it's just, it's just much easier. Thank you. And uh, probably the last question. Um, mm -hmm. Can I ask you about uh, localism? Uh, for those who don't know what localism is, uh, this is a um, uh, perspective of uh, deities that are closely tied to a specific region or community. And um, so many Christian even uh, Egyptologists say that uh, localism was prevalent uh, perspective in Bronze Age. 
in the time of Moses and patriarchs. So would that fit well with the view of a temporal God? To some extent. So when you're looking at the Old Testament, you'll see these statements over and over again where the the Hebrew people, they'll enter into a new location, a new land, and they're like, I wonder what the gods here are like. You know, uh, do, will, will, will Yahweh actually come with us? Because we're in a different place. You know, like they got these worries. They got these concerns. Mm -hmm. And I find that fascinating because I don't, I don't have this intuition that like my, that my deity is just stuck in one spot. If you've got a view that God is temporal, like I do, and if you've got a view that God is time itself, like I do, then a lot of this should just really go away because time is this thing that's ubiquitous across the universe. So, so is God going to be localized? Well, no, no, he's going to be really omnipresent, like very literally omnipresent. He's, 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 he's wholly located or he's you know located everywhere and every when. So the problem of localism should go away uh, on, on my view. Uh, but yeah, it's an interesting thing because you really do have to deal with what's going on here in some of these biblical passages. And you see the Hebrew people try to develop that and, and eventually asking questions like, what if I run over here? Like David has this nice psalm where he's like, if I go here, God, you're there. If I run over here, God, you're there. And you see this in the story of, of Jonah as well. He's trying to run away from God and yeah. he gets on a boat. And then God's like, you can't run away from me. God, I don't know what you're up to. Right? Like, this isn't, this isn't how this goes. So you see this kind of un, like this, this belief get challenged constantly in the Bible itself and God going, look, I am omnipresent. I'm not like some of these little, little deities that you, you think I'm, I'm much bigger than that. Can you uh, just describe uh, what is happening in academia? Uh, does maybe more uh, scholars accepting uh, this view of temporal God or is it, um, um in extinction or whatever <laughs> it's a bit difficult so when you look at say the 1990s is when um a lot of this really got big again like this this question so um in the early 90s is when you get the book god in time for views so there's all these debates that are really starting to kick off uh leading up to that and this from like the 60s on to the to the 90s and then divine temporality just becomes like the dominant view like it's just the most obvious view uh thanks in part a lot to a lot a lot of what William and Craig has done because a lot of people are just like yeah you know this seems to make more sense today though it's a mixed bag because there's been a huge renaissance of people wanting to endorse classical theism they don't really know a lot of times what classical theism actually says, but certain people have made it sound so cool, or they made it sound like you're an idolater or you're an atheist if you deny classical theism. Um, somehow you're this wicked, evil human if you deny it, and you're like, oh, I don't want to be an awful person. You know, I don't, you know, okay, I'll affirm classical theism. So they've developed this really big rhetoric that's been persuading a lot of people uh, to, to, to try to go back into the loving arms of a God that cannot possibly love them, who only loves himself. That's the explicit statement of classical theism. God only loves himself. Uh, so it's right now we're seeing a renaissance of this classical view, but the exact numbers it's, di it's difficult to say because there are a lot of people like me who just want to resist it and go, no, no, uh, this doesn't make sense. Here's why deal with the objections, please. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, do you have any message for, uh, end of this, uh, interview? Can you send something, um, uh, for us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I so I'm so I'm a Christian theologian, and I'm actually ordained in this church in America called the Christian Church. Uh, so I've worked in churches in the past. So a big part of the research that I'm doing is just trying to figure out here all the different theories about the nature of God, which one is coherent and which one uh, makes the most sense. So that way, I can really try to develop Christian doctrine in a, in a meaningful and coherent way. So it's a big part of what I'm up to is just trying to go, okay, let's, let's really come up with a, an understanding of God that actually makes sense and is, 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 doesn't have all these contradictions in it. And that fits with what the Bible says. It's a long ongoing project, but I think it's a good one because kind of the whole reason I got into this is because I wanted to know God and love God. And if I don't know who God is, I, I don't know exactly how I'm going to love him. So I decided to enter into this whole field of just trying to figure out who exactly is God. Thank you. Uh, do you have any suggestion about what books to read uh, or how people can contact you and uh, support and similar? Mm -hmm. So I've got a new book that's going to be coming out soon called A Little Book About a Big God, which is going to be um, my current thoughts about what I think the nature of God is like and why God would create anything at all. 
and it's about and it's going to be only it's going to be quite cheap and it's going to be uh, only 100 pages so that's hopefully going to get published in a in a month or two uh if you want to come study with me so say you want to do a masters i i teach for a masters program at the university of lucerne which offers a a online masters program in philosophy theology and and religions so you get a robust education in the history of philosophical theology across Judaism, Christianity, and Islam uh, from ancient world till today. So it's, it's really it's a really good program, and we got amazing people teaching for it. And I can also and I also do uh, tutoring for it. So I also do one on one tutoring for the program. Uh, if you want to contact me, you can contact me through my website, which is rtmullins.com. dot mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, this is all for this uh, interview. Uh, Dr. Mullins, thank you for uh, your time. And uh, uh, we were uh, blessed. I learned a lot, really, <laughs> because I cannot uh, read your articles. They are too hard for me. So this is this was great. <laughs> and um, uh, thank you, everyone, and see you next time.